Well, good morning, Rise and Shine. This is Morning at NTV, getting you started into the day and getting you, of course, ready to conquer because it's not good to start your day and not really know your vision or your purpose or know where you're going. Don't go blindly into the day. Always set yourself up right. And, of course, this morning we start with giving you information. Remember, this show gets real issues from you, real people, and for you, real people. Later on in the show, what's ahead, what we'll be talking about, that's coming up. But, of course, we start off with what's making headlines, what stories are there for you. I'm Flav to Musime. I'm not alone. I do have uh, my co-host who's actually here in studio who'll be giving us her thoughts on some of the stories that are happening, you know, what she's highlighting, what's so special about today. There you are. <laughs> Good morning, Flavia. Good morning. How are you? Good. Yeah, it's a great day. Mm -hmm. Are you looking forward to this? Yes, you actually dressed for, <laughs> for, <laughs> for, a, for a lovely day. You're dressed for happiness. You yeah? have to dress in bright colors when you feel some way in the morning. You're right, yeah. you're right, you're right. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, uh, I do have a few stories that are making headlines. We have uh, everything from New Vision to Daily Monitor, even going to our neighbors, Kenya, uh, Standard. Uh, we'll start off with Uganda, and I think uh, March 7th and 8th, UCC, which is Uganda Commission, uh, Communications Commission, actually issued a ban. And this is after a spate of killings, murders, kidnaps, and many people were using, you know, phones uh, of either people kidnapped or their own phones to uh, call and police was having trouble tracking and they said you know what let's put a ban on the sale of sim cards and they were saying that um, people who are selling sim cards as on the streets hawkers and all of this there's no structure to how people are buying sim cards and we cannot regulate or monitor it and as such they put a ban on sale of sim cards in ungazetted places that was on the 7th and 8th of March. Fast forward to today, what's the news? UCC saying that AfriCell faces suspension over a breach of this directive. Now, in their letter, the UCC boss is saying that, listen, you are still selling SIM cards in these places we told you not to do it. Everything from street hawkers to vendors, your SIM cards are still being sold. Now, this is just a warning. So if you're part of AfriCell, not to fear, it's just a warning so far. And they're saying that should they not have a good reason, a good explanation, why the SIM cards are still not sold in gazetted areas, their um, contract will be um, revoked or suspended. And they're saying that should the worst come to the worst, everyone who's part of AfriCell will then be moved to another network or something, and which, which is quite sad. But yes, um, so far the directive says that, you know, they're supposed to be selling SIM cards in specific shops and specific um you know gazetted shops and they must register those shops that you know where to go to buy or replace your sim card because we need to be able to track and know who's calling who why they're calling who and you know it can be tracked back to you and i think i have i, I know exactly about this issue because there's been a bit of facebook fraud and people where they can use numbers and you send mobile money or you call them and once you track it back to the national id that is attached to that sim card it's actually not there so let's let's adhere to this it's for all of us but that's the story you can look out for in the daily monitor are you a young person i mean over 70 percent of people in this country are youths now if you're 45 plus you're not youth <laughs> i know in this country we have this whole thing of thinking youth goes all the way till 60 but uh government has actually um it's quite some good money 17.5 billion shillings has uh, been given to the venture capital fund and this was actually started by the ministry of uh, gender labor and social development for young people it's actually a partnership with centenary bank now this just gives consensual loans to individual youths and also to groups so if you have formed a group and you have a plan and they're looking to about 4450 total projects so this should go a long way you know young people are complaining about unemployment the same we're educated Every single year, a university, and we have plenty, are churning out graduates, but graduates who are going back on the streets, who have got no options. So I think the best way is to make them job creators, and job creators need capital. In fact, SMEs, we need to kind of have this discussion, Mala, about how young startups can have access to capital one of these days and, and tell them there's so many other ways apart from going to a bank or apart from waiting for government to give you <laughs> 17.5 yeah. billion yeah. Uh, it, it, because I'm guessing you pay back this money somehow somehow so there must be other ways to actually create capital or to you know pull together resources don't you think yeah yeah for sure um, 
for you to start a business you don't have to wait until you have this big chunk of money you can actually just start with what you have and then you grow that start small and grow you know um, that's the key don't wait until you have that big chunk of money and there are many avenues for that so yeah. I'm sure we'll be having that discussion sometime next week yes yeah, someone actually told me one of the sources of money uh, if you want to start a business, is friends and family. <laughs> now it depends which friends and family you have. Right? We're not saying go to the richest uncle in the family because anybody can give you something. And I think what used to baffle me, I think we've spoken about uh, people who have gone to um, the UAE and different countries for jobs. And you have this, this thing of where family members come to you and say, please, family, pull together some money for me, for me to acquire a visa and to get, you know, flights and everything, I need 4.5 million. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I'm thinking, if your family can pull together 4.5 million shillings <laughs> or 5 million shillings, isn't that great startup capital? Mm -hmm. So why are you going to Dubai where they don't know you? <laughs> you know, start using the money here. But I guess you have to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll come back to more, of course, business stories um, there in uh, the new vision. We're going to Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, I know you're going to talk about something interesting, Mala, when it comes to, you spoke even about maternal deaths yes. last week yeah. and maternal health. Interesting story in the standard in Kenya. They're saying abortion. An unborn child is not human until they're born. So basically, if, 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 if you are pregnant, whatever you have is not considered human. Um, it's only considered human if it's born if it actually comes into the world. So they're arguing in court because they're trying to sort of um, rework the constitution to and include, abortion. yes, to not to legalize abortion. Mm -hmm. They want to sort of um, have guidelines for safe abortion. And just so you know, s abortion is actually terminating a pregnancy and the same, most of it happens about 28 weeks. Mm -hmm. But safe abortion is what's done by a medical doctor and it's only done in circumstances where the doctor feels medical doctor not herbalist yeah. a medical doctor believes that um you know the mother's life is more important at this time or their complications and the mother's life is more important um to be saved than actually the child now for example i'll give you statistics here in uganda 26 percent of maternal deaths are because of unsafe abortion in uganda abortion is illegal unless done by a doctor and i've told you the circumstances your life at the time must be considered more important sometimes you have complications and anything can happen and they say you know what Let's save the mother instead of the child. Now, if we have those in Kenya, the doctors who are actually you know, obstetricians, gynecologists, they're in court and they're testifying and saying, as much as the constitution believes that life begins at conception, doctors and gynecologists are saying, let's consider life beginning at when the child starts crying, <laughs> not when they're in their stomach. The other day, Malai, you were telling me you spoke to your children while they're in their stomach. Yeah. <laughs> so you consider them human, right? <laughs> they are human. I personally believe that, you know what, life begins at conception. Mm. And um, I don't agree with what they're saying, that um, a child is only human once it is born. Um, for me, that thing is alive. Uh, Flavia, I can't wait for you to experience that journey. Like you can <laughs> actually feel there's someone breathing inside you. Mm. So um, it's quite controversial. Um, I'm not for it personally, but hey, let's see how this goes. Mm, yeah. And, and I think the argument for abortion in Uganda has been that, you know, so certain people, it's out of rape, that someone is pregnant and they, or somebody feels they really, they're child mothers, is it? Mm. People who are less than 18 and they feel... They can't really raise a child. And they're always saying that th the reason abortion is not um, legal is because all those reasons, according to them, are not valid enough reasons to terminate a life. So, uh, again, abortion is illegal <laughs> in mm. Uganda. You know mm. what was interesting? I, I noticed that when I was reading up on this, they said that women aged 40 and above in Uganda are the ones who actually carry out more abortions or oh, really? seek mm. more abortion mm. I thought to myself uh, 40 plus mm. Mm, you know were you not expecting it uh or is it the case of oh i'm 45 i'm not really going to go into the whole trying to have more kids now i'm yeah. not ready for it but hey. i think maybe it's that um but for me 
abortion is only permissible for mm -hmm. me if there's health issues you know if your health is at stake yeah. um if um the child's you know chances of becoming a healthy baby or leaving um are quite low then that's the time i feel abortion can happen but if you're okay and the child has chances of becoming healthy you know growing into being a healthy child then why not? Yeah. <laughs> so government has cancelled Pastor Kakande's Mubende land titles. Uh, Pastor Kakande was before the land commission and he was being grilled. Sometime back he claimed he was not feeling well, he couldn't speak so much, he needed a translator. I keep people who go to this land commission <laughs> who go to testify. I mean, they all have, they have all sorts of excuses, but they've decided to actually cancel those. And uh, the affected residents were spread in 56 villages, so it was going to be really uh, a big issue. So this cancellation is really in response to the Mobende District Land Board Secretary, that is uh, Mary Jessica Nankabira, who actually said that and admitted that the process of giving away the land to the pastor had actually been flawed and had many gross irregularities. But by the time a land board <laughs> mm. comes out to say, fine, 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 we were wrong in how we actually, you know, gave out this land, we were wrong in how we distributed these titles. And imagine 56 villages were going to be affected. So I'm, I'm guessing how does a land board not see that, you know, this is such prime property and fine, it was, he said it was for a business for a rice irrigation scheme or something like that. I guess it was business, but sometimes as much as business is great for the people, it creates jobs and all that, you should see how it affects people and you should acquire land in the right way. Yeah. So I'm not sure if this is a win <laughs> or a loss, depending on which side you are. But yes, government has cancelled Pasta Kakande's Mubende land titles. I know, Mala, as I try to get us some more stories, you had something on your mind? Yeah. Um, today, um, actually, there's a story um, in the Daily Monitor of yes. the government um, saying that, you know what, we'll begin to pay civil servants based on the number of days worked and not the, just the blanket monthly salary. And they're saying this is um, set out to, and it's actually aimed to curb absenteeism at work. Um, just the other day, we were having a discussion about um, the current health system in Uganda. And um, actually, one of the highest contributing factors is because most of the health workers are absent in hospitals and so this is actually you know um, making the queues longer and people not getting you know the quality medical care that they actually deserve so um they're going to install biometric gadgets in every single public hospital, every single public school, so that when teachers come in, when these health workers come in, they actually, you know what, check in, and when they go out, they check out. So then the government will be in a position to make sure that they calculate the number of hours this civil servants actually worked and the number of hours they did not work. So you're paid based on the work that you put into your job. I think that's a good move, that's a great move, because then that means that the quality of education in public schools will then increase. The quality of service delivery in public health hospitals will actually increase, Flavia. Fantastic. Um, <sighs> I'm seeing a story here because I know Ugandans complained to um, Kadaga, who is the Speaker of Parliament, <laughs> and they're talking about vehicle inspection and most motor vehicle inspection, which was actually um, is still a contract by SGS, if I'm not mistaken. And I think where we are now is that you don't have to take your car for inspection for now until they figure out, you know, what's going to happen. There was also a suggestion that perhaps motor vehicle inspection should go to the car bonds, that before I buy a car, why don't you just inspect them so that you don't have to inspect me every other time and I pay money. And now uh, the Speaker of Parliament, Rebecca Kadaga, wants police to be able to take over motor vehicle inspection. We've had issues with police, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but they're saying that they need to take over the role of motor vehicle and also traffic roads inspection. Now this I support because it shouldn't just be cars. It should also be the roads we use. So they say that um, instead of undermining the police, which is actually the national force, maybe we need to facilitate them, you know, and uh, give them the necessary support and also the funding to be able to carry out these inspections on the vehicles and also inspections on the roads. Because let me tell you, I might have the best car, it's new, it's brand new, it's, it's working crisp, and then I have a bad road. Within time, you, you're going to have to inspect my car and find problems, right? So I guess this makes sense. As much as we're equipping them to inspect our cars, also make sure that uh, the roads are in good shape. But it's not just them, of course, the Ministry of Transport, you have UNRWA as well, mm -hmm. included in all of this. Yes, Mala. Yeah. Um, today marks the International um, Fistula Day. 
and um, the health ministry um, was coming out to actually say what fistula is and I will quote them they say fistula is an abnormal opening between the back canal and the bladder or rectum of a woman that results in the con constant leakage of either urine or um, um, a feces through the back canal and so they're saying you know what um, fistula needs it's actually still happening and we need to address it um, the current statistics um, stand at at least one percent of women in the reproductive age um, go through this during childbirth and part of the solutions um the ministry of health says you know what let's educate our children um especially the teenage um girls let us you know let stand against um teenage pregnancies because part of uh, the cause of fistula is when a teenage mother a, a teenage girl becomes a mother her organs are not mature enough to you know um cater for childbirth so it's part of the contributing factor for fistula um, they say that um, we have 2,000 repairs are carried out every single year every single year 2,000 repairs that's a big number we need to bring that down and it all trickles down to you know what let's talk to our children let's bring the number of teenage mothers down and if you're pers uh, if you're a mature person and you are pregnant make sure that you constantly attend antenatal care because that's the position that's the, the time when they can be able to see and actually test if you're gonna have a natural birth if you can you know sustain a natural birth or you get an alternative uh, means of giving birth so it all boils down to us the society to be vigilant and to take this issue seriously and they actually say you know what when it comes to an antenatal checkups let the men support the women it's not a battle for women alone. We need men to come up and stand with us and support us in this. Okay. Um. Last night, uh, as I was watching the news, um, there was a lady who actually caused an alarm because she was being picked up by men who were not dressed in uniform, but they were claiming to be police or claiming to take out of the police and people sw swooped in you know because I think we're, we're in high alert now we know about kidnaps and if anyone screams for alarm please be a good neighbor you know <laughs> you find out the story after but go and help and I was glad that people actually around, rallied around her and of course later on they found out the men were actually police and there was a case to answer and mm. that was a, but then I think we're somehow sort of on a high alert and there was a story that in case you missed it, um, they, were lift, they are leaflets that have been thrown uh, around uh, Ginger Town and these are anonymous people who are saying that um, they're threatening to attack residents and, and also do all sorts of things. They're asking for about 50 plus women and so residents are saying let's beef up security and interestingly what I had read is that there's a 30 man committee that has been constituted to beef up security across the villages and also the residents have resolved to hand over to police anyone they've caught they, they actually caught loitering around the villages at night now <laughs> i know that we are very alert but does this mean it, first of all if you're a drunkard this is the time <laughs> to stay in your home and drink in your home <laughs> because people are on alert now yes. if anyone even me if someone walks close to me for some time, my friend, I'm screaming <laughs> because we're now on high alert. So if, it's not just in Jinja, it's even here in Kampala. So the residents are going to start reporting people who they think are suspect. Please don't fall in the suspect category. <laughs> Here's how it is. Stop looking at people for more than a certain time. You know, it's at night, especially those who walk at night. Yeah. You know how this works. If someone is walking too close to you, looking at you a certain way, you're going to cause alarm. So be very careful. It's hard times here in Uganda. If residents in Ginger are saying that anyone caught loitering at night, we're reporting. Kampala might be worse. <laughs> what do you think about that, Bala? Well, I, I, I totally agree. Um, we need to be careful, yes. and especially when it comes to our home residential spaces. And I think it also boils down to, you know, the people who have been given that responsibility to take care of, you know, our apartments, our estates, wherever we live. Do we speak to them? Because at times, um, I'll give you an example, Flavia. For us, we don't take it for granted. And I'm happy about uh, the management of where I stay. Um, they take time to train the guards and they take time to tell the guards, you know what? Um, no nanny should walk out the, you know, the main gate with a child. You're getting? Yes. No nanny should walk out the gate with a child. And that's important. So they know in case any nanny walks out the gate with a the child, then 
the blame will actually go back directly to the guards. So um, I think us also beefing up and training the security guards on what the expectations of the residents are and what they need to do and step up to their duties. You know, there's actually a story I was trying to find. It was a tweet. Um, and this tweet is uh, they're actually looking for a young young girl. Yes. Um, baby Chelsea, who is uh, missing from her home in Kira. I'm not sure about the update on that, but we pray for the best. Mm -hmm. And they were saying that um, this child was taken by the maid. And as you're saying, these are people you trust with your children. I know a friend of mine told me that for me, I've resolved to taking my children to boarding school <laughs> because then maybe I don't have to deal with third parties. But a school is also third party. Yeah. And, and uh, as long as it's a boarding school, yes, I get it. It must be safe. But mm -hmm. even at home, you must, you must tell your children where to play to and where not to. Times are hard. You know, we used to go and play at the neighbors for the whole day. And Nighttime. your mother has not set eyes on you <laughs> since morning at breakfast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you last had a cup of breakfast at home, and when they blinked like this, you were gone until 6 p.m. And they asked you, where were you at, Mama Gundis? And nobody cared because yeah. they trusted each other. Mm -hmm. There was that communal trust where you knew that if they were there, they probably had lunch, <laughs> they probably showered. It's okay. And if they were in discipline, they probably disciplined them. Nowadays, you're afraid that even the next gate, you know, there might be someone who's not, or maybe who doesn't even have, um, you know, a liking to you, who has yeah. issues with you, and they're pending and might decide to take it out on your child. So it is sad where the world is going, but just take care of your own. You yes. had a story, Mala? Um, just the other day we were having um, a discussion with um, the police. Yes. And they were saying that they actually encourage community policing. But do you think it, it, it's practical in Kampala? Because I feel in Kampala we live individually. It's even hard for you to know what your neighbor does for a living and all those things. What do you think? How can we start to start living as a community? Flavia, you know, to you. <laughs> I, I'm actually one of the people who really believes our answer to the insecurity is community policing. Yes. Because um, in, I live in Chihuahua and our neighborhood has had issues. Well, not now, but before we had issues. And we used to be for a long time the safest neighborhood. You'd never hear a problem. And then every other weekend there was a car that was hit because someone was oh. going home. And while they were at the gate hooting, in just seconds, someone hit a brick on the car and something happened. Until it happened in our own compound. And, and my neighbor, okay, I'm not sure I'm, I'm supposed to tell you my neighbor. <laughs> Security purposes, I won't yes. tell you my neighbor. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But um, one, of, one of the neighbors was coming home and, you know, Saturday night, they, were, you know, they went out and they came home late and they hooted. And I think for a second there, the, the, the gate skipper took a bit of time to open mm. and they, they hit a brick on his car. Wow. And... You know, I, I'm not a deep sleeper, so I heard it. And I opened the door. I don't know what I was going to do. I don't know how because I don't have a gun. I don't have a knife. I don't know what I thought I was going to do. But I walked out, put the lights on just for people to know that there's someone there. And yeah. true to it, you know, the, the thugs actually ran away. And then later on, every other neighbor came out <laughs> and asked, what happened? Mm. And then from there on, we decided, no, don't sleep while your neighbor is being killed. You know, if you hear something, be vigilant. And I got to know that just the next um, fence, a woman used to, okay, based on violence, she had been being bitten by her husband over time. And the neighbors knew about this and she used to cry because of that. Mm. So one time she comes home and she's driven into the compound and thugs actually hit her car, take her out of the car and start beating her. Oh, and wow. so as she was crying, you can imagine, people thought her husband was the one beating her and nobody saved her. And from there on, we decided to be more vigilant. So I know that we have a community WhatsApp group with our police, OCs, and everybody mm -hmm. on the same WhatsApp group that if you have any issue, you know, if you feel there's something suspect in the neighborhood, you just write on the WhatsApp group. And even if it's not the OC who has seen the message, someone in the group sees the message and actually helps get you either to police or comes and saves you. So listen, community policing is yeah. definitely the answer, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm, I totally agree with you. We need to start at some point and embrace this. Definitely. You know, you're watching Morning at NTV. Our hashtag is Morning at NTV as we've taken you through some of the stories. But we're going to come back. Let's take a short breather. You're watching Morning at NTV. 
Good morning. You're watching Morning at NTV. Uh, just a few minutes back, we're telling you some of the top stories to look out for as you head into the day, as you get yourself a copy of the papers. And nowadays, everything's technological, so you can always have a copy of it on the E. And um, we're talking about probably the biggest story that I've noted for me is the fact that, um, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to equip the police, and that is, uh, well, Speaker Rebecca Kadaga says we should equip the police with resources and funds to help them actually take over mortal vehicle inspection and also road inspection. Mm -hmm. And um, ahead we'll be talking about how South Africa is looking to have a redistribution of land in the country. And some are saying really that actually might be detrimental to the economy. But this morning, I'm also alone with me, Flavio Tumsime and... Malaki Vilode. Welcome <laughs> special. Welcome back. Yes, uh, this morning I said she's dressed for a happy day. <laughs> <laughs> I always used to do that. I'd wear colors just to make me smile. Yeah. So I'd like to first get your thoughts on what's what's on your mind this morning. What are you just thinking about? Uh, for me, it, the thing that is always on my mind every single morning is the importance of having a constant morning routine, mm -hmm. which is key because then you get to, you know what, um, tweak your mind to doing certain things, even if your body does not want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just last you start week. with the hardest? <laughs> Yes. Exactly. Just last week you are telling me about the way your body was so fatigued and tired, but you had to tell your brain over and over we're again, going. you know, we're going, <laughs> we have to go, we have to do this. Yes. So it's the same thing. It's not easy, mm. especially um, being a working person and having early mornings and late nights. But it's, the trick is always in the mind. If you tell your mind, you know what, we have to do this. Mm. And then you set your mind to a certain routine, then it's easier. And now, coming to think of it, it's actually real because I remember um, when I was giving birth and training my children to get a certain sleep pattern, I was told it's a matter of routine. Huh. Yeah, it's a matter of, of routine. Do and you then routine, squeeze the baby's face to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, no. um, I don't have kids, <laughs> but I've always, they say you stay up the entire night yes. when you're a new mother. Yeah. So how do you tell this child it's now time to sleep? <laughs> you just get them to a routine. For example, um, if it's at night, if it's 7 p.m. and you want them to get that at 7 p.m., even if they don't feel like sleeping, go to bed, switch off the lights and pretend that you're sleeping and sleep. You do this for a newborn? Yeah, for a newborn. You need to start as soon as possible. Cause I, somehow, isn't this a form of abuse? Why are you switching <laughs> off lights? <laughs> you have <laughs> With to. Three week baby. So, they, so that they can understand, you know what? Oh, it's, it's dark now. It's dark time now. To, time oh, to sleep. Mommy is sleeping. <laughs> I also need to sleep. <laughs> okay, this is probably also a form of abuse. Someone said that if you let children cry it out, it's, yeah. it's an emotional thing. If children are crying, don't run to them. That you let them cry it out, you let yeah. them feel it out. Eventually, they'll say, "Why am I crying? <laughs> no one is coming to me." <laughs> but um, also, you, you shouldn't um, let them cry too so long. Much. Yeah, because yes. if then the crying is prolonged, it means there's something disturbing them. So oh yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. So you have to check on them. <laughs> the biggest thing on my mind has been all the marital advice I'm getting. Oh, and, yay. Uh, Oh, don't clap. It's not a good one. <laughs> <laughs> don't clap it's not good news uh -huh. um i think um forget the marital advice mm -hmm. just advice in yes. general mm -hmm. i think people tend to advise based on their experiences yes their uh, thought process or it's just about them mm -hmm. You, I want you to notice that many times you've advised people. You're not advising them based on their story because, let's be honest, you probably will never know the entire story. You're advising people based on your experiences and your story. So someone was telling me, oh, congratulations. But marriage, if it's hard, get out. I said, yeah. I haven't even gotten into it. <laughs> You're telling me to get out. Oh, my God. But I, but I was guessing that, you know, sometimes someone's experience informs how they see a certain institution. So it's like getting a job and someone says, oh, but if your boss stresses, but how do you know my boss will stress yeah. me? Because it's based on their experience. So a lot of people, uh, funny enough, a lot of people have been positive, okay. but I've had some negatives, you know, where people say, you know, I'm like, ah, you need to train them. They need to know you're bad. <laughs> I'm like, why is this a war? <laughs> like this people, like, who do you hang around? <laughs> my friend, it, it appears I have the wrong friends, but I will change my ways. So South Africa has um, Cyril, uh, uh, Cyril, Ramaphosa mm -hmm. as their president now and he was just was he here or was it the son was here and some relatives mm -hmm. I didn't really follow much of that story but uh, his son was actually getting introduced not married but although that's regarded also a marriage yeah. here um, uh, to one of actually uh, former prime minister's niece eh, but Ugandans we can try and push the relations because mm. 
I, I preferred a closer relationship because I don't get a niece. Yeah. Like I thought if it's your daughter, we can make a headline out of it. Nice. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we're stretching. But anyways, back to his country, South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, they're doing a land redistribution because, you know, after apartheid, mm -hmm. <laughs> apartheid, mm -hmm. as us Ugandans call it, mm -hmm. the land was given, you know, land has been taken up, a big chunk of land has been invested in, has been taken by um, foreigners and whites and, you know, Africans in South Africa were saying that we need some sort of redistribution where the land comes back to its rightful owners, one, and also to, you know, South Africans, which is African South Africans. Mm -hmm. And I think, which is the obvious one, a lot of people are saying that it's okay to redistribute and give back who you think is the rightful owner. But what about those who've been on the same land, cultivated it, uh, and developed it in whatever way, helped the economy? If you give it to people who don't know that sacrifice, don't they then take backward the economy, mm. you know? So as much as we believe that this is the right thing to do, are there measures and structures to implement this? Correct. And that's the biggest question that they have right now, mm. implementation. Implementation. Is this the right way to implement? How are you going to implement? And it's a big battle ahead. It's taken years to get there. Yeah. I don't know how they're going to work. Uh, do you think that if, for example, someone has been in a country for 30 plus years, They've built Serena, for example, and they're foreigners. Do you then believe they don't have the same equal rights and footing as a Ugandan who was born here, who is a you know natural birth Ugandan who probably should just wake up one day and own Serena? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it works that way. Um, I think there are two sides to to to, to the same matter. Yeah. Um, if this is a person who has stayed in this you know um, land for over thirty mm. years, mm. then uh, for example here in Uganda, if you stay here for is it ten years, then mm. you're actually eligible to register for citizenship. citizenship exactly. Yes. Mm. So if these people actually are citizens and they got that land in a legal way, um, be it leasing, be it you know purchasing it mm. after getting citizenship, they've even developed it and developed <laughs> yes. it. Then I think that. Uh, they are rightful owners. But if now there's that question of, you know, at least um, putting into perspective that uh, this initially was an, uh, an ancestral land and there are people who are maybe jobless and they need this land back, of course they can't have the land back, but how about the management of, for example, that hotel then pays into perspective the issue of, you know, absorbing these people and giving them jobs maybe. You know, um, and I'm going to be very um, sensitive as I give this example. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, my producer was saying that, by the way, even in Uganda, we've had the same issue when uh, the late Idi Amin also, you know, expelled Asians and yeah. decided that it makes more sense if the Ugandans own this land yeah. and own these properties instead of the Asians. And, you know, that didn't really also go well. And we're still seeing that, you know, there's also retrieving this land back to the Asians because now everyone has freedom to invest and live here. Mm. But... Um, in South Africa, I think the, um, there's that issue where you have white South Africans against, or black South Africans against white South Africans. And then you also have black or African South Africans against fellow Africans from yes. different parts of mm. the world. Zimbabwe, you know, Kenya, Uganda, wherever. And the issue, I think the biggest issue was around jobs. We are in our country, we are unemployed, and you have our jobs. Yeah. And the xenophobia kicked in and they started killing each other and all of that. And I have experienced that, which I never used to really understand. Being in South Africa and a fellow black person, yeah. you know, uh, just looks at you like, why are you here? If you're here for tourism and you're here to enjoy, great. If you're here to work, there's a problem, mm. you know. And I, I don't get that because especially being from Uganda where anyone and everyone can come here. We're such a hospitable country mm. that if you're an expert at a job, good for you mm. do it mm. whereas there because there are very few you know jobs that are being taken up by the south africans themselves it's a battle and so they feel that anyone and everyone you know if you're african go home mm. <laughs> let's fight a battle with foreigners but you really shouldn't be here but other than that it is a very friendly country it is a country that's given opportunities to many africans that is south africa so it's not that bad but it does exist but mm. i think it's also informed of their history let's be honest yeah. you know they've gone through apartheid for so many years they've had to fight back for their own identity so yeah. it makes sense that there's still some people who have reservations mm. towards that so interesting um South Sudan women activists um, have actually called for an end to the conflict in the country, but they're saying that as the delegates are holding a forum to actually, um, it will be in Addis Ababa, and uh, they're saying that if you want to jumpstart the process of peace, include women. 
They're saying that don't don't uh, be so biased in the peace process that you forgot inclusion yeah. of women. Mm. And you know, someone the other day told me that women we like to be feminist in everything. <laughs> we like to fight for women's a women's place at the table for everything and anything. And I don't know if this is a case of merit, a case of the fact that they'll have something to say, but do you think we should start with including women in every discussion just for the sake of including a woman first before we then see our impact? I don't think we should include women just for the sake of having, you know, the numbers mm. that hey, we are not Women are here. Exactly, yeah. women are here. <laughs> no. Yes. Um what women I think are asking for is mm. you know what? Put us are the somewhere exactly somewhere mm -hmm. at the decision making posts because we deserve it mm -hmm. we have what it takes it's not a favor we're no longer asking for favors but if y it's a must for a woman to be represented somewhere because mm -hmm. you can it's imagine yes, 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 yes. we've been having boards of men year in year out especially in africa but let's now embrace women i think we are stepping up to the game women are now skilled we're not going to schools we have a lot of substance to bring to the table when it comes to pertinent issues. So I think that balance is important. But no, it's not a favor. It's not a favor. Put it there on merit. Actually, um, for, the, for the case of this particular story, because South Sudan uh, women activists are saying, include us in this peace process, because since, what, 2013 in this conflict, mm. women and elderly persons have been the most affected by the conflict and the war in South True. Sudan. So you're not going to have a peace process that has discussions when the most affected people are not, are represented. not represented on the table. Yeah. So I thought it actually does make sense. They, makes have, sense. they have a good valid reason why they want to be included. So for those who think the women want to be included in everything and in anything, <laughs> that's not really the case. <laughs> that's not really yeah. the case. Yeah. But um, so I, I thought that, that was brilliant. In any war, by the way, women, children, and the elderly are the most affected, it's so true. it's it's great. So the peace talks will be, or the peace process, the conversation will be had had in um, Addis Ababa. Mm -hmm. So great stuff there for for that. Still on women. Yesterday we were celebrating the International Preeclampsia pre um, yes, yes, Day, yes, yes, yes. and um, experts at Mulago have come out to say what you know what um, medics are the reason why many women are losing their lives. And according to the statistics that were released, um, nearly three in every 10 maternal deaths among expectant mothers at Kawempe Hospital are caused by the onset of hypertension and delayed referrals. And um, so it's experts in Lago that are saying, you know what, and this big number is actually happening in um, Kawempe, the maternal deaths. And so um, they're saying the statistics actually indicate that the number of pre eclampsia cases have increased over the years um, from four. 15.9% to um, in 2015 to 20.7% 20 in 2016 mm -hmm. and just recently it has risen to 23.6% yeah. and all this they're saying it's still around the same hospital um, so it all boils down to I don't know um, Mulago at, uh, experts at Mulago are saying you know what it's an issue of the medical attendance not being keen enough or if it's not being keen enough, is it a skill issue? Mm -hmm. Do we need to recheck this? Because um, uh, just the other day we were having this discussion and we were saying the importance of antenatal care. Yes. Um, so they're saying it's not just about antenatal care. You will go for these antenatal checkups. But if then the medical expert does not know what signs to check for to detect if you have preeclampsia or not, then... Because preeclampsia is big, they're saying when it actually progresses, the mother will start getting convulsions oh, and wow. chances of um, the mother and child dying are high. Because then when it, it's, it's high blood pressure that cannot be controlled. So if it happens, then it leads to the, um, the dysfunctioning of key organs like the liver, the kidney and also the brain. So that's why um, preeclampsia is actually a big contributor to maternal deaths. Mm. I know that when such issues come up, people are thinking, oh, it's just one problem being high lighted it's yeah. not that bad but there's a section of people who are obviously affected and that's why it's being discussed yeah zimbabwe as we know um a miracle happened <laughs> last year when um the president was it actually well months have gone by yes uh former president robert mugabe was ousted and now they want him to actually testify and this is because millions we're talking about 15 billion dollars in diamond revenue was missing somewhere mm. and 
Um, they want him to actually testify. It was supposed to happen, I think, at the start of this month, which didn't happen. But they're still looking, you know, to set a new date for hearing um, his um, side of the story for this. And some activists have said, why? The man is 94 years now, yes. And they're saying, you're embarrassing him. Yeah. Why do you want this old man to go there and start talking about issues and start, you know, looking bad to the public? Which still surprises me. And don't get me wrong, for a good time, Robert Mugabe um, is to be applauded for what he did for Zimbabwe. Yeah. But of course, it drained and dragged out to a point where he was starting to receive some of his um, good effects. Mm -hmm. But I was... I was stunned at how his country was doing everything it can to not embarrass him. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. To make sure that this 90 plus year old man goes out peacefully, quietly, no one taints his image. And I'm thinking, that, that's, that's recommendable. So yeah. even now, imagine 15 plus billion dollars in diamond revenue and they want him to testify because he was at the helm of some of this money going missing. And they're saying, no, let him, let him be in peace. Whatever missing piece is there, we can figure it out. The man is too old to be here, and plus we've let him go in peace. Why bring him back to embarrass him? Is not excusing our leaders. <sighs> I think um, we're still in Africa. I don't care if you're 100. <laughs> I think when still when you were stealing our money, didn't you know <laughs> you would one day be 94? Uh -huh. Jeez. At the end of the day, we're still in Africa and we're Africans. We have this thing of elders. respecting <laughs> our elders. <laughs> and um, that comes with, if you don't respect your elders, then you're going to get curses. It's, it's an African belief. So I think uh, that is a factor that is coming into play. But hey... If, it, if, it, if our leaders, a lot about let me tell you, for example, in Uganda, there. it's obvious we, we are hurt. Some of our leaders have not, def our members of parliament have not defended us right. There's so many issues still affecting us from health to education yeah. to whatever. And we're still saying, what are you discussing? So we have something against them. Yeah. And you can't tell me because my MP has a headache today. <laughs> we, let's not embarrass him. Let's not make his life hard. Let him not account. You know what I mean? So yeah. we also can't say because our president, when he was making bad decisions, he was a fit, strong, able-bodied man. <laughs> now that we have let him go in peace, don't bring him back because he's old. That's not an excuse that a man is old, that he can't answer or be accountable for what he did. So yeah. I don't believe Robert Mugabe should answer. Or I think maybe it's a thing of they're already tired. They don't want to follow up with what is already lost under his leadership. My point <laughs> is, when you're embezzling money, you <laughs> you are not too old to yeah, embezzle the yeah, money. Yeah, you need so, to yes. stand up and own up. Own up. Yeah. I, I don't believe in forgiving <laughs> leaders. I don't. Uh, we are lacking money. Children in, in hospitals yeah, are dying yeah, yeah, totally because the, the healthcare is bad. And you want us to forgive you because you're old. Anyway, okay, I've really brought it back home to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but the hashtag is morning at NTV. We would like to tell you what's ahead on the show. Let's take a breather first. You're watching Morning at NTV. Yes, sir. Good morning. You're watching Morning at NTV. You're with me, Flavio Tumsima here. And Malaki Villa Odera, welcome back. <laughs> yes, and uh, we're talking about what's ahead on the show for you today. This is Morning at NTV. Use the hashtag. Tell us what's on your mind, your thoughts on some of these stories. And if you believe that at 94, honestly speaking, Robert Mugabe should not be testifying in anything <laughs> because the country doesn't want to embarrass him and they feel that at his age, honestly speaking, he should be given leeway to just sleep, to just rest. Does that mean that our leaders also... In the future, when they're too old, we should let them go and never account for anything they're doing. Mm. I, again, I am putting emotions in this one. But what's ahead on the show? <laughs> ahead on the show, today being um, a, a Wednesday, mm. and um, the theme for today being finances and service delivery. Yes. Um, then we'll be talking about contracts, because then it touches on all the businesses, employer to employee. So the issue of contracts. Do we understand what contracts are? Do we know the importance of contracts? Do we know how to go about, you know, knowing if a uh, contract is actually enforceable by law or not? Yeah. So this, uh, um, this is the discussion that you're going to have today, just giving off information of why we should know um, contracts, why we should understand them before you put pen to paper. Have you read it through? Do you understand what you're getting into? So that's the discussion of today. Let me tell you what's a catch-22. You have a contract in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, you want to work for, let's say, NTV. And NTV says, Flavia, here's a contract. And, of course, they, by, by law, they're supposed to tell you, read through, mm -hmm. uh, consult, then come back to us. And 
you sit down, you say paper and pen, you say, mm, this one, no, this close, no, this close. That's if you really do understand mm -hmm. it. And you bring it back to the company and say, here are my edits to this contract. And they say, ah, oh, no, 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 no. Those clauses actually are, you know, for everyone yeah. in the company. You're not exempt. Um, so we'll keep them there. And so you, the next time you're signing a renewal, you're thinking, ah, why am I even bothering to read? Because I don't think they'll change anything. Mm -hmm. And I think most people face that where they know that the company, apart from how much you're getting paid, not much can change. Mm. They really can't rework that contract. But actually you can, you do have the option to go to a lawyer and sit down and say, this doesn't favor me, this favors me. Or just explain to me what I am signing on. It's almost like you're signing over your life to yeah. a company. And the next time you refuse to do something, they tell you your job description actually covers everything. Mm. So next time you're finding yourself, you have to be here as a presenter. You have to be a cameraman. You have to do sound because you signed it <laughs> and didn't know you actually signed <laughs> It. Exactly. And you're arguing with your boss and they're telling you, but friend, that's what you signed yeah. in the contract. You said you can do everything and anything above and beyond. Mm. So be very careful. But we're trying to get our man on the ground. That's Andrew Chamagero and find out where he is. But um, you work in consultancy. Yes. And I, 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 that's what you're, you're sourced out to help a company for a certain period of time, which Correct. means you have short term contracts yes for what three months two months it um, depends at times it stretches to a year to a year yes but when it's short term um do, do you are, are you keen on what you're signing because some people sign short-term contracts but there's an extra three or six months mm. after that where you can't either work for our competitors yeah. or you know work for someone who's in line with what we do do you do you check that you have to check that mm. especially when um, you are in consultancy you really have to check that because different companies operate differently and different policies if if if, if this company operates under x policies then the next one doesn't mm. necessarily operate on the same policy. So you really have to go through every single clause <laughs> and understand. Mm. And that's why um, when you're given a contract, then you need to pay into perspective that issue of sitting down with the client and going through it with them. If mm. you're not comfortable with a the clause, then you get to an agreement and say, you know what, this is not um, favoring me. I'm not comfortable with this. Can we change this? So that we all, you know, it's a win-win situation. We all gain out of this. So you really have to pay attention to every single clause. It is those clauses that you actually don't understand. If you do not go a step further and yeah. consult, that will end up tying your hands at the end of the day. So mm. you need to understand every single sentence, every single clause in those contracts yeah okay and uh, as as we are getting an andrew chamago is on the ground he'll be joining of course this conversation but also you need to check the value you're getting for your contract some of you are saying pay me 10 million shillings and the company says no problem and they pay you the 10 million shillings but they they have clauses that when you look at it you're not actually being paid your value so you you, you maybe there's a breach or one of you decides to terminate the contract or exit the contract and you realize you've been tied down. You actually can't work for anyone for another two years yes. that is in line with that. And perhaps your skill is accounting and they're telling you you can't work for any other accounting firm, for yeah. example, for about a year. So you've made a loss despite what you thought you had your value. Mm -hmm. Andrew Chamagir, are you with us? Good morning. Yes, I'm with you. Morning, ladies. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. It seems to be a little chilly here. It's a cold, it's a cold, it's a cold Wednesday. Okay, it explains your mood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. That doesn't... Uh, my mood, I'm always geared up, but it's a cold Wednesday and it's quite one of the best days of the week. I actually love Wednesdays. But I'm excited. It's a new day. It's a new breaking of deals and stuff like that, Kogamba. I'm just excited to start with. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were just there talking about contracts. You hinted about Flavia. Yes, yes. Is it the 17 point something billion to go to the youth? Yes, through venture capital. Ah, man, I'm excited about that because <laughs> my youth, Avant one c this money is going to transform their lives if it's well channeled. And I'm glad it has come through the Ministry of Labor uh, because this is where it actually well disseminated. We had the one of the youth livelihood. Now, if this one is actually brought and it's put to good usage, 
Yes, well, we will fight poverty, I'm sure. Yes, it's actually a partnership with the Ministry of Gender Labor and also Centenary Bank. So concession loans, whether you're an individual or oh. a group, and you have a good plan or project, so about 14,000 people will be getting some good money. So mm. you, are you still in the youth group? <laughs> eh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a youth. <laughs> so this money, when it comes through, I'll actually just add in more money. And you never know, I could actually change my story. Yeah, but I, th I don't think we should be giving young people money without telling them, you know, how, teaching them some skills or yeah. some business expertise. Because we're going to give you the money, then you, your plan was still on mm. paper. You don't know how to execute and you can't pay back the money. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. But, but we were well, talking I about how I, I had on the show is contract. I agree that uh, we need more capacity building and skills equipping for the youth, then we can actually give them money. If you've given someone a skill and they have tried on their own and they fail, then you give them some money and you see how far they can go. I agree with that. Definitely. And we were talking about how I heard on the show is contract. So over to you. Oh, yes. Ahead of the show, we are having a discussion about contracts. We as Ugandans, time and again, we've had deals, we've had businesses, we've been employed, but do we know the documents we sign? Do we actually take time to read? Do we know how it affects us? And do we know how we could possibly breach these contracts? That's a conversation coming up later. Just keep it here, Morning at NTV. You're watching Morning at NTV.